So a, um, a husband and a wife were arguing one night, and, um, you know, as can often happen, uh, the, the argument got a little heated and a little out of control, and before he knew it, the husband looked at the wife and said to her, woman, why did God make someone so beautiful, so stupid? And she, after a moment's pause, she thought about it, and she turned and looked at him and said, oh, I know why. Um, he made me beautiful so you would marry me, and he made me stupid so I would marry you. City's <laughs> 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 like, yeah. No, You know, I, we're going to be talking about divorce tonight. We're, we're in that passage in Malachi that <clears throat> deals with divorce. <coughs> it's a pretty heavy subject, um, especially when you take the real biblical approach to it. You know, sadly, to varying degrees, you guys are probably aware that the church butchers this subject in our modern day. The, the, the modern evangelical church has absolutely butchered this subject probably maybe even more than the Catholics have. Um, the Catholic Church, I think, has maintained true, quite honestly, vastly more than, uh, more than the, a large amount of the Protestant Church to some of the older biblical doctrines. And um, <clears throat> without getting into the details of that right now, I, like, marriage is a big deal, and divorce is a really big deal. One of the interesting things is I was meditating on this week you know, of all the patriarchs and all of the heroes in the Old Testament, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I never had until I was thinking about this. You know, of all of the sins that they committed, adultery, fornication, murder, you know, all kinds of things, um, of all the things that they did, not a single one of them got a divorce or divorced. Um, and that's, I may be wrong on that. Maybe if you're thinking, well, I can think of somebody, but... Um, as I was thinking about it this week, <clears throat> you know, of all of the mistakes that they made, and can I tell you guys that there's, there's a certain, there's something in that to the gravity of divorce that God is, has embedded in that reality that not a single one of the patriarchs or um, the, even the prophets, I mean, you could look at like um, Hosea and how his wife left him and went back to her prostitution, but the Lord told him even to go back and marry her again, even though he had a just cause for a divorce. He didn't divorce her. And um, there's a really heavy truth. And this is actually, honestly, it's going to be on my part intentionally heavy because uh, the church, the modern church, makes way too light of the idea of divorce. And, and, and so much so that we compromise over the direct sayings of Jesus um, as far as divorce is concern. It's a really hefty, heavy deal. Um, as I was studying this, I read a lot of interesting stuff this week. Most of it's secular, just because I know what we think about um, divorce, and I know um, what the Bible, largely I know what the Bible, and I think most of you guys are well taught, and you know what the Bible says about divorce. And so I was reading a lot of secular um, stuff this week, a lot of um, kind of memoirs, a lot of things that people said after they were divorced and stuff. And, you know, interestingly enough, as you study this concept, if you're to study, like, the statistics, you're going to end up with one <coughs> picture of divorce and why people get divorced, such as this. Um, one of the most, one of the, the studies that comes up most readily when you Google it, and admittedly those things can be manipulated, but mm -hmm. it's by a, I, I don't know if I would say a complete, it's a reputable source, sort of, um, in, in the secular sense, um, they, they gave eight reasons. I'm only going to deal with the top six for the, mo the, the top six most common reasons for divorce. Now, I have to tell you that in this thing, this list is based on voting of people who had already gotten divorced. And it's important because it's, it's not a list given by psychologists or psychiatrists. I'm not a huge fan of psychiatry or psychology. That being said, though, the reason I make this distinction is that this list isn't compiled um, by a study of, by a group of people who studied people that were divorced. It's compiled as purely results to a questionnaire to people who had been divorced. And there's a big difference, and hopefully I'll kind of elaborate upon that a little bit in a minute. But this is, you know, so these people who had been divorced, they were given a, 
um, you know, questionnaire. And also, interesting, you should know, whenever people use statistics, you can say almost anything you want with statistics because we don't know what the questions were asked. Maybe there were only eight questions and maybe there are a bunch of other causes in divorce. Um, and they only asked people, what were the, what was the number one thing that caused your divorce? And they only had eight options, you know. And so they're kind of, they can manipulate the statistics. Statistics are, you know, as Ravi Zacharias says, you can get statistics to say anything. But, <clears throat> so of these divorced people, 73% of these um, ex-married, these exes, said <coughs> that, um, and these weren't, the question wasn't actually what was the main reason. The question is the factors and the, was this a factor in your divorce. 73% of these people who had been divorced said that lack of commitment was a factor in their divorce. And, and what they mean by that is that they didn't fight hard enough to keep the marriage um, when things got rocky. They're not really talking about infidelity. That's a whole different issue. But 73% 73 73 of these exes said that lack of commitment to the marriage um, was a, a, a major factor in the divorce. And, and why should that be a surprise, though? Because we, you know, in our generation, the only thing that anybody's really committed to, they're not committed to their country, they're not committed to their business. They might meet most people, sadly, and this is a real indictment, most men are more committed to their their college alma mater sports team than they are to their spouse. You know, it, it's a it's a graver issue if you insult the Gators to some people than it is if you insult someone's spouse in front of their face. And that's just flat out true. Um, I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, the the sad thing is is that most people in our generations are. I'm in a different generation than you, if you didn't know. <laughs> there might even be a generation between us. Um, <coughs> Um, most people, the only thing in their, in their life that they're really, truly, deeply committed to is themselves. And that's a recipe for disaster in marriage. The only thing they're committed to is their own happiness. Common reasons, though, that were given for divorce. Lack of commitment. Second highest factor was too much arguing. 56% of them said that um, too much arguing was a major factor, that they didn't understand or appreciate or validate the other person's position. Um, the third was infidelity. 55% said, 50, more than half of the people said adultery was a major factor in their divorce. That's incredible. I understand the lack of commitment. You go through a season, someone gets kind of discouraged or something. They don't even have the energy to put towards the marriage. But over half the people said that infidelity was a, that's incredible. It's not now, in this statistic, remember, this is divorced people. This isn't a statistic looking at all of marriage because you can really be like, wow, half of married people are having affairs? That's not really what the statistic is saying. Half the people who got divorced cited infidelity as a major factor in their affair. And they talked about in this particular article that something you guys, I'm sure you've probably heard, that um, all sexual affairs start with emotional affairs first. And I think that is one of the realms... That is one realm of psychology where in recent years I think they've actually nailed it. The realization that, that most affairs that happen with married people don't start with a sexual attraction. They start with, a, with an emotional you know, connection. You know, a, a guy who when he goes home in the evening his wife just rides him. Why can't you do this right? Why do, why, well, and she just, she's giving him a hard time. She thinks that that's the way to train him to become the man she wants him to be and it's absolutely not. But whenever he goes home, he finds resistance, he finds criticism, you know, um, and, and then he goes to work and a, a new woman is hired at work and, and she does what his wife used to do when they were first a couple or before they were first a couple. He, he's sharing an idea he wants to do and she goes, oh, you're, you're so brilliant. That, that's a great idea. Then he goes home and all he hears from his wife is, you're so stupid. You can't even do this. Why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't... And, and that, that is the recipe for an affair, for infidelity. And actually, even secular psychology is realizing this, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, the fourth was that <coughs> they married too young. The people said the fourth major factor in their divorce was that they married too young. And, um, and 46 said that that was a factor. 46% said that was a factor. Um, Unrealistic expectations, 45% said that was a factor. And lack of equality, 44% said that was a factor. They're not, the lack of equality, they, they, they defined it. And they weren't talking about like the husband um, believing that men were better than, men are better than women. That's not what they were talking about. 
what they were talking about there is that in marriage, oftentimes one of the people um, in the marriage ends up doing the brunt of everything. Most of the dishes, most of the, the cleaning the house, most of the handling the tedious things like bill paying and whatever, and, and there's a lack of equality in, in the responsibilities in the marriage, and that leads to, that's what they're talking about, not really so much the classical boundaries where it's like the chauvinistic, like, I'm a man, I work, and you do everything else. That's not really what they're talking about because a lot of times today, nowadays, it's actually the reverse. You know, it can either, either party can, be, can have a, a root of laziness. Now, <clears throat> these things, now remember what I said. These are all responses that people who were divorced gave. These are not educated responses based on studying a group of people. These are just simply kind of the raw material. And there's a reason that's important because these are actually classically different than the, the old reasons that people gave for divorce. They were actually, those, the classic reasons are even more symptomatic, like money problems, you know, in-laws and things like that. This actually, and you can almost see where this, this study was kind of focused on a certain thing and almost on producing a certain result. Um, but the reason I say that is because all of these issues that were mentioned, they're all really actually symptoms. And you guys understand the difference between symptoms and um, root causes, the actual disease that's causing the symptoms. And it shouldn't be surprising that they're just symptoms because it's literally like talking to the patient. These are the patients. The person comes in, they're sick. And you say, well, what, is it, what's, why are, what, what does your sickness look like? And these are just simply symptoms, what these people shared. And so quickly, I want to deal with some root the root causes. And the reason I'm dealing with this now is because as I was studying this this week, and I really hope I can get through this whole teaching. I have a lot of material that I want to read um, uh, as I was studying it this week, it, the raw material, you know what you end up finding? You end up finding references, little comments that are made by these people, some of the people who've been through divorce, some of the people who study it. You find some, <coughs> in the middle of everything they're saying, you'll find a comment that sticks out, and it's like, well, that's a really big issue. That's actually the root cause. That was the thing that, 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 that drove the, 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 the destroying um, drove the destroying blow into the marriage. Um, and you, these are actually going to seem very obvious once I sang, but the reason I'm saying them, though, is because I want these to stick out to you as I'm reading the later information, if that makes sense. I really want you to notice these things in the later information because they're really important. But these, I believe, um, and there are more undoubtedly, but these are the ones that really kept coming up to me this week as I was studying this information. The real reasons... Um, um, the real reasons that, that people ended up in divorce. First, obviously, selfishness. This shouldn't be that big of a surprise to us, but it's just selfishness. It's selfishness. Our culture tells us from birth, love yourself, be true to yourself, and keep your individuality. Now, I actually have a friend and his wife, and they would tell you readily, Scott and Mel Armistead, that they would tell you readily when they got married. Um, I don't know if they were actually both even following the Lord when they got married, or if either of them were. <coughs> I can't remember, but they would readily tell you that at their wedding ceremony, like a lot of the advice that all their friends and family were giving to them really revolved around like this one idea of keep your individuality. That's the key to a good marriage. Don't give up your individuality. Well, that is crap. We all understand biblically that that is just absolutely the opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says that the two shall become one. Let me just, you know what? It's like these people are so stupid on the world. It's like they, they do these studies and they find something. They think it's like revolutionary that, you know what? Um, if you have separate online media profiles and Facebook, that's a leading cause of divorce nowadays. Wow, really? Hmm. Well, I wonder why. Why would that cause problems if, if, if Alicia had a separate Facebook account? And I, I don't, just don't understand why. I love how... Uh, I'm just going to preach this, and this is going to offend. Please don't go tell people that do what I'm talking about, or whatever. You can ruin friendships of mine. But I, I, can I just be honest with you? I understand why people who are married, generally, I don't, I've actually, <coughs> people who are married, the wife puts her maiden name in there. If she takes her husband's name and her Facebook account, she puts her maiden name. Why? So people can find her, right? That's a terrible idea. I understand if she wants some of her old girlfriends to find her. Find them before you get married, okay? I'm really honest here. I'm gonna, I, I love the fact that, you know, besides Josh and Sydney, none of you guys are married, and thankfully Josh and Sydney are still on the honeymoon, and so this pretty much doesn't affect them. And so I can just 
preach this exactly like it is in the Bible. It would be a totally different ballgame if I was preaching it from a pulpit to a room full of people who are married or largely are divorced. Because these issues are so hurtful, some of them, to, to talk about the biblical truth. That's why the evangelical church is compromised on it. But I'm telling you, it's, it's like ridiculous that, that, wow, it's revolutionary. I heard it on John Tesh the other day, you know, scanning the radio. This thing that, like, if you have separate um, media, you know, uh, social media accounts, you, there's like a, you're like this much more likely to get a divorce. Why? Because your old flame can find you. You know, duh. Why is that like rocket science? Can I tell you guys, there's a very simple reason why Alicia and I have a single account, because we are one. And I know that people in the world are like, that's stupid, you know, or whatever. I don't care. We're one. We have, we have multiple bank accounts, but they're all one bank account. We don't have separate bank accounts. That's, wow, the same study found that people with separate bank accounts also have a much higher divorce rate. I wonder why. Maybe it's because it's easier for the husband or the wife to hide purchases or a condo or a woman living somewhere else. Huh, what a surprise. If you, when you keep your individuality in all these different areas, you're much, 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 much more likely to get a divorce. It's absolutely insane. Um, but it's not uncommon and nowadays, you know, at a marriage so many a ceremony or at a rehearsal dinner for some stupid uneduc well, or educated cousin. You know, a lot of times they're educated. I call it uneducated. But going through the college liberal system, you know, I'm sure Mark would agree. We talk about like stuff on a regular basis, the idiotic things that his professors say that are completely not true and, and are just against common sense. This idea of keeping your individuality in marriage, that's actually going to come up in some of the things I'm going to read later. <clears throat> pride. Secondly, pride. Pride is a big, it, it causes a lot of problems, but one of the things <coughs> that came up <coughs> repeatedly in my research I use that term loosely, this week. Um, one of the things that kept coming up repeatedly, though, as I was studying this stuff this week, um, a surprising number of people who have been divorced admit after the divorce that the impetus of the breakup was that in a relatively minor argument over something pretty small, the D word was said, and they were too prideful to take it back or to admit they were wrong. And that's actually going to come up in a a study, but it came up, it kept coming up that actually a surprising number of people who get divorced, get divorced over some, they didn't get divorced because one of them killed one of the children, you know, or, you know, you know, committed adultery or whatever it is. They got divorced because they were both having a bad month and they were stressed out and they came home one day and they were arguing after weeks of kind of not, you know, communicating and not connecting. And one of them said, well, we just need to get a divorce. I, if you don't change, I'm going to get a divorce. And you know, within a day or two, they regretted saying the D word, but they were too proud to go to the other one and say, you know what, I was sorry. And they got the ball rolling. You know, there was hurt inflicted on the other person. They got the paper, started whatever. And before they knew it, they were divorced. And they're like, what happened? It wasn't a big deal. I don't even remember what the issue was that we got divorced over. But pride... Obviously, and this isn't rocket science, right? This is logical. If you go into marriage and you're completely, you're just a, you know, a self-loving little ball of pride, you know, you're just going to hurt the other person. And inevitably, you're not going to be able to bend and you're not going to be able to forgive. You're not going to be able to humble yourself. <clears throat> and you're going to destroy that marriage. The third major reason that I find, though, is lies. And these are the things we're going to spend um, most of the rest of the time confronting, though. <clears throat> And I want to reiterate that almost all of my research, actually all of my research on the internet was all on secular sources intentionally. But even on the secular sources, these three lies keep coming up over and over and over and over again. And let me, let me tell you that the people aren't telling them as though they believe them. These people are actually saying, this is where I blew it. Because a lot of the stuff I found actually interestingly enough is there are quite a bit of people writing about regrets about divorce, a very surprisingly large percentage of people, and we're actually going to deal with these, um, actually regret getting divorced. And so there are these three main lies that I've really, they keep coming up as you look through all of this information. And the first lie is that you will be happier and better off once you get divorced. You'll be happier and better. The second lie is that the kids will be okay and will quickly adjust to the divorce and will be better off. And then the third lie is it's not a big deal. God will understand. Now, these three lies, <clears throat> they're kind of flipped in the passage because we have three points tonight from Malachi chapter 2, verses 
13 through 17. And the first point is that divorce destroys society. These points are all answers to the question, why does God hate divorce? Why does God hate divorce? The first thing is that divorce destroys society. The second point is that divorce devours children. And then the third point is that divorce is self-destructive. So in verse, we're going to read verses 13 through 17 now. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Now this is something that's completely, it's, it has to do with what's going on, but it's completely aside, so I want to make a comment. So what's going on here um, is these people, they're doing these things. They're marrying pagan women, and they're divorcing their spouses. <clears throat> and at the same time, they're doing these things that are um, ungodly, that God said were absolutely wrong. They were still coming to the temple of the Lord. They were still weeping before God. They're like, God, why don't you hear my prayer? And God wasn't hearing their prayer. He wasn't regarding their prayers. He wasn't answering them. And they're like, they're essentially like, why aren't you answer, answering us? And can I tell you that... Um, there are seasons in your life that you're going to pray and maybe you just want to hear a word from the Lord. Like I was, I was thinking about, um, and this may be a bit much, um, but someone was praying recently in a prayer meeting that I was a part of and they were praying for someone who had joined this ministry and was part of this, they had joined a program where they're in this program for three years and they were going to do this thing. Now, the reason they joined this program was because they felt called to, to go into this ministry that this program produced. And, um, you know, after six months or nine months into the ministry, into this program, though, this person was really praying fervently to hear from God and to hear his will. And um, I heard my friend praying for him, and I was just kind of like, it, it really hit me as they were praying because they obviously were talking to the person, and they're like, God, would you just really manifest yourself to them? Would you Would you speak to them and really... Um, give them, you know, wisdom and, and, and revelation of what they should do. But here's the thing. They just joined a three-year program because God told them to. And what I'm, what I'm, all that is to say this. My experience has been that there are often times in my life that God has told me to do something. He gave me a miraculous calling to be in the youth group at Calvary Chapel when he did that. And there were various times throughout that five and a half years in that ministry where I was like, okay, Lord, I really want to hear from you. I really want fresh revelation. What's your will? What do you want us to do? And I got nothing for months and months and years. None of those big major revelations that we all love hearing like, man, God spoke to me. Look how he spoke to me. I'm dead serious. I got nothing for months and years. And so you know what the, the answer that kept rising out of my heart over and over again is? You've got your marching orders. Fulfill them. Because there's an interesting thing. If you guys, you've heard me read that quote, probably some of you multiple times from We Would See Jesus, where Roy Hessian talked about how a lot of Christians are seeking for those, in, they're, they're inordinately seeking for inner spiritual experiences, you know, some crazy revelation of God. Can I tell you that he doesn't do that on a regular basis for a very important reason? Because it actually doesn't develop faith. Have you ever noticed, and I'm getting a little off here, but I really think this is important. If you've ever looked at Saul and David, they're a really interesting study because Saul started out, it's really hard to avoid the fact that Saul, King Saul, started out really well. He was really humble in the beginning. He, he started out really, really well. Um, they both started out really well, but there is a distinct difference in both of their callings, both of their anointings. Paul, Saul's, sorry, King Saul's was highly miraculous. If you If you go back and read the story like, all these things Samuel did that were miraculous and kind of confirmed that God was calling him and that he was the one and all these things. David's, on the other hand, it was miraculous in some degrees in the sense that Samuel's like, oh, that guy's the one. You know, the oldest son, he's like, nope. You know, and then he's like, that one, no. And then, and then David comes in. So there was some miraculousness with David's calling. But really, compared to Saul's, David's calling was relatively unmiraculous. And what I'm getting at is this, is that as you kind of meditate on that truth, you you start to notice that I think in Saul's life, there was a shallowness. And there was a shallowness largely due to um, this kind of focusing and desiring for God to do that again. Do you remember, if you read this, if you study his life, one of his big downfalls was that time right after he was anointed, 
where Samuel said, hey, wait, I'm going to come back in seven days, and then we'll sacrifice. And seven days later, Samuel hadn't come back. Though the time had not expired, he hadn't come back yet, and Saul took matters into his own hand and sacrificed without him. And then right after he did it, Samuel came over the hill, and he's like, because you've done this, God is going to remove the kingdom from you. But there's this sort of thing in Saul's life, this focusing on me, even with a spiritual experience. This spiritual experience has to be about me. And if you're still tracking with me, I hope you are. Some of you, you've got your marching orders. You know, like Mark, I really believe you're supposed to be right where you are. You're supposed to be in college. You're supposed to finish the program you're in. You might not get some really awesome, miraculous revelation of God in the next couple of years because you have your marching orders. You know, some of you guys, you might, Kiana, you have your marching orders. You know, it, it might be kind of pointless to really be like, I really need a fresh, you know, I need you to visit me. And, and, and I'm not saying don't seek the Lord, but my point is, is don't get discouraged if you don't get, while you're in a, 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 a path where you know the outcome and you know you're supposed to be there, don't be surprised if you don't get the hyper-spiritual, like, revelation that's that's just absolutely mind-blowing. And I hope you understand me, because I'm not saying don't seek the Lord, don't seek the Lord on a regular basis. You do. But I think some of us, particularly um, in, because I share some, so often about a lot of the things that the Lord has done in my life and the way that he's manifested himself to me, I've noticed over the years that I've engendered in some of the people that I've taught this kind of expectation and obsession with hearing from the Lord in a miraculous way, when quite frankly... I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't tell you that before the first time that I heard from the Lord in a very, very, very miraculous way that I would say to you, like, um, uh, maybe the, the most incredible way was the day that Pastor Howard's wife pulled me aside and spoke to me. You know, I was following the Lord for almost six and a half years before that happened. In a large part of those six and a half years, I really sought God and I really wanted to hear from him in a way like that, and it didn't happen. I'm not saying don't seek the Lord, seek the Lord. But have a realistic expectation that if, you, if you're already in his will and you're, you know what you're supposed to be doing right now, this is where he has you, seek him, but don't get discouraged when you don't necessarily hear from him or get some overwhelming revelation of him. That being said, the reason I went into that, there is quite possibly another reason that you might not be hearing from the Lord. If there's some gross sin in your life, some really gross, cruel, unloving sin like this, where these people were divorcing their wives for reasons that were ungodly, and yet they still had the audacity and the ignorance or the stupidity to approach God as though nothing was wrong. And so that was all my preamble to make that point. There's the exception. There's a possibility if you're covering the, the Lord's altar with tears... Um, and he's not regarding it, and you're not getting anything when you seek him, there's a possibility, and I want to make it clear, this is, as we, we delve into this whole idea of divorce, um, I want to make it really clear, I'm not sure there are many sins, biblically, that are worse than divorce, actually. That's a heavy statement. That's a heavy statement, but you know what? Um, I really respect James Montgomery Boyce, and he is really harsh on this subject. And he's actually not the most conservative commentator. I was really surprised, actually, with how strictly he dealt with this subject. I was, uh, it, it really um, gave a lot of credence in my mind, particularly when you read some of the things Jesus said about divorce. Divorce is a horrible, horrible thing. And God hates, hates divorce. And so these people were doing something terribly cruel and unloving. Particularly, now, I want to make another note here. This passage is dealing with the men. Now, in our culture, it's very different. In that culture, I don't even know. I, I honestly, I can't tell you I did the research on this part of it. I don't even know if the women could divorce their husbands, to be quite honest, in this culture. But I know in our day and age, the women divorce their husbands probably as men, much as men do. Mo a lot of the situations I've been privy to, that, that's actually going on, it seems, as much or almost as much. But this here is dealing with the men, okay? And these men were doing something terribly cruel to these women that they had committed themselves to, that they had covenanted themselves to. They, they had done something terribly unloving. They were leaving them destitute, probably open to the perils of a world um, where a woman had very few ways to make money in that day. 
something terribly cruel. Why am I re- reiterating this? Well, because First John, you guys know that First John says that, you know, if you say you love God and you don't love your brother, you're a liar. You can't love God and hate your brother. Your brother? What about your spouse? Someone that you covenanted yourself to become one with. You're not one with your brother. This is someone that's even closer to it, closer than a brother. And in God's economy, this is a big deal. And so all that is to say this. This is not even one of my points, so I apologize for that. But this is something that strikes me from this passage. If you are covering the Lord's altar, if you're coming to the Lord repeatedly over and over again, and you're even shedding tears, God, why don't you hear me? Why don't you answer me? Part of it might just be because you already have your marching orders. Or there's the possibility that you have some gross sin in your life where you, are, you, are, you hate a brother. You've been cruel, uh, overwhelmingly cruel to a brother or a sister in the Lord. Now, obviously, um, other than Josh and Sydney, who are not divorced, um, none of you are even married. So you can't have done this particular sin, but I think it's a valid point that needs to be um, dealt with. So, and this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with good will from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? <clears throat> because the Lord has been witness, because, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? In that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in them, or where is the God of justice? And we dealt with that last week, actually. But you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And we talked about, we kind of delineated that verse there, that part of that verse where it says, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord. In particular, it's not saying everyone, everyone who says evil is good. It's saying that everyone who does evil is good. And this this is a gross sin in the evangelical church and Catholic church too. At least the Catholic church preaches against it more than the Protestant church does. This is the, this is the gross sin. A lot of churches you go, you'll go to nowadays will straight up call evil good, particularly on this, this, this topic of divorce. They'll say to a husband, I don't even know. In the circles that I, Alicia and I run in, we encounter a lot of Christians and I don't even know how many of the ones I, we've talked to in recent years are getting a divorce, and you ask them, well, why? Well, I'm just really unhappy. I'm just, I, I'm so miserable. We're so miserable. I think we made a mistake. No, there's no infidelity. Now, occasionally you hear that. Well, you guys, that, I'm sorry. Jesus said, you can't do that. He said there's only one reason for divorce, and that's infidelity. And he says, he, he went even further. You guys, <clears throat> I'm sure you've probably read the verses. It's Matthew 5, verse 31 and 32, and Luke 16, 18 where he says that, that if a man divorces a wife for any reason except um, immorality, he, he causes her to commit adultery or he commits adultery, particularly if you get remarried because God sees you as married to the first person. That's incredible. Those are pretty, pretty strict, harsh verses. So divorce destroys society. <clears throat> Two ways that it destroys society. Firstly, it destroys covenants, and secondly, it destroys personalities. It destroys covenants, and it destroys personalities. Let me read what James Montgomery Boyce says on, uh, he's actually quoting someone on 588 here, of his book on the Minor Prophets. (coughs) I quote here from Walter Mayer. Quote, because marriage comes from God above and not from man or beast below, it involves moral, not merely physical problems. A sin against the commandment of purity is a sin against God, not simply the outraging of convention, the thoughtlessness of youth, the evidence of bad taste. The Savior tells us that when God's children are joined in wedlock, they are united by God and beneath the evident strength and courage and love that, is this, that this divine direction promises, there is a penetrating ominous warning. 
those who tamper with God's institution have lighted, to fu- have lighted the fuse to the, explos- um, to the explosive of retru- retributive justice. Marriage is so holy that of all social sins, its violation invokes the most appalling consequences. Sodom and Gomorrah were burned out of existence because of the vile disregard of the holiness of marriage. David's rule over Israel was blackened by his marital follies and by the royal lust that forgot God and dedicated itself to raging passion. The Hebrew people dropped out of the family of nations largely because of the vicious practices associated with Balaam worship. Instead of trying to find loopholes in God's commandment or trying to convince ourselves that our spouse is not a Christian or is at least not behaving as one and therefore divorceable, we ought to be shouting the holiness of marriage from the housetops. It is better to endure much physical, much personal unhappiness than to treat as expendable the solemn vows of the wedding service. It destroys covenants. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage as a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. It's the first covenant. Biblically speaking, it's the first institution. And I already referenced those verses, but let me read them quickly. Matthew 5 says this. Matthew 5, verses 31 through 32. Say this. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit, commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Can I tell you guys, that verse might stand, not stand out to you or be a very hard verse until you start considering being leadership in a church or a pastor who has to preach that behind a pulpit. Can you imagine one of you, Josh, David, Chad, standing up at the pulpit at church on a Sunday morning and preaching that verse? Anybody out there who's divorced for any reason except, who is divorced for any reason except sexual immorality, you're committing adultery if you're remarried. That's a heavy concept. Now, Boyce goes through to delineate some things. Obviously, if the divorce was pre-salvation, it's, it's, it's under the blood. There's nothing you can do about that. But if you got divorced as a believer, you got divorced for a reason other than adultery, and you married another person, you're committing adultery in God's eyes. That's a heavy concept. You will really make some people really angry. I actually know of a Calvary Chapel that split over this very issue. There was a Calvary Chapel in Sanford a number of years ago. Deland, I'm sorry. A number of years, this is 15 years ago, the Calvary Chapel in Deland split over this issue because the pastor, actually at the time I thought he was wrong, but he taught it straight biblical and there were divorced people in the church that were like, what? And they left and the whole church split and fell apart because of this one doctrine, because the pastor preached it as the word said. And at the time I was young and I was stupid and I was easily influenced by trying to draw people in, but now I realize he was right. He preached it as it was, but it, this is such a heavy concept. It has, it has split churches, and a lot of churches just compromise on it. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I was reading, I think it was an Alan or a Catholic, and he was talking about, he was um, expounding on those verses, I guess from Paul, where he says, um, if, if an unbeliever is married to a believer, and if they want to leave, let mm-hmm. go. Yep. Can you comment on that? Yes. Let me, I'm just going to read Boyce because he actually is very elaborate. Uh, elabor- elaborate. S- say it. Elaborative. No, he's very articulate. This is the word I was looking for. Sorry. Um, let me deal with that real quick. <clears throat> So this is Boyce, this is um, chapter, this is page 587. (coughs) 
The point I am making is that the priest's permissive attitude towards divorce and their own bad examples contributed greatly to the loose moral climate of Malachi's day. And ministers are doing the same thing today. Even in so-called evangelical circles, they are a major part of the problem. In preparation for this study, I looked through a sizable collection of contemporary books on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And my impression is that in all but a very few cases, the overall tendency of the books is to lower the standards previous generations have set and propose that the world's contemporary, contemporary low practices are not so bad after all. One writer has even gone so far as to suggest that remarriage, even when there have been unbiblical grounds for divorce, is desirable. I think this is sinful and tragic. Let me acknowledge that there are ambiguities in some cases. There are also cases where remarriage is permissible. Jesus spoke of Moses granting the right of divorce because of the hardness of people's hearts. Paul recognized cases in which an unbelieving spouse departs from the marriage and nothing can be done to bring the spouse back. In that case, the believer is not in the wrong and is not bound to the marriage, 1 Corinthians 7.15. Jesus spoke of the possibility of divorce for the cause of fornication. I believe that in the case of a person who was married and divorced and then subsequent to the divorce became a Christian, it is right for him or her to marry again for the first time as a Christian, since if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Unfortunately, these few and carefully qualified exceptions have been used to excuse almost anything and open the doors and open the door to remarriages that in the vast majority of cases must be judged offensive to God on the basis of Malachi 2.16 and other passages. So I agree with him. You are right. There are ambiguities and there are exceptions, but I think the problem is is that, like he said, most evangelicals, they they take those verses and they they just throw the doors wide open. So I know I have a friend who um wife found her own like a friend whose dad wife uh, found um, her old flame on Facebook and she ended up divorcing him for her and they were Christians they went to church all their life it's really tough <clears throat> God willing I can never imagine that I would face this issue but having thought about it at Bible college I'll just try and talk about this as though I'm not married um, at Bible college, when I thought about the issue that you raised, um, if it happened to me, how would I handle it? How would I reconcile myself? How would you reconcile Matthew, um, what Jesus said in Matthew and in Luke, and what <clears throat> Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7, in the way that I personally would believe that I would handle it, though I, this would never happen, but it's completely and purely hypothetical, is if my spouse cheat, if my, not cheated on me, if my spouse was an unbeliever and left me, I would not sign the divorce papers. I would refuse to get divorced until they got remarried. And at that point, they became unfaithful. When they remarry and they're now having sex with another person, they were at that point unfaithful to the marriage. And then I would see myself as absolved from my commitment. But the way that I rec- and it's a little more complex than that when you really think this through, because you might be talking about years living alone. But we have to remember about these issues. If there's one thing at the core of this issue is that our happiness is not the chief goal of our lives. Holiness and being well-pleasing to God. And I believe that to delineate this for this issue further, I really believe the answer is, is for the person who has an, un, the, the, uh, the spouse is a non-believer and departs, I don't think it's as simple saying, okay, you're free. For me personally, my conviction is, is that if that did happen to me, I would not remarry and I would pray for us to be reconciled and for that person to be saved until that person, it became evident that that person had become unfaithful, and that at that point I would feel it um, personally a freedom and an absolve the the abolition of the marriage, if that makes sense. That's how I, I when I use when I kind of meditated on this issue back in the day. Um, I, I obviously don't. I haven't meditated on it for a long time. That's, it happens a lot. Yeah, well, and I would say on the day they're given to somebody else, you're absolved. But before that day happens, even if it's the rest of your life, you live single. And you refuse to sign the papers. That's my opinion. It destroys covenants. It destroys society. 
It destroys covenants. It, it really destroys people's understanding of covenants when divorce happens, the way it affects children and our understanding of covenants. Covenants are a big deal. When you, you give your word to someone, you think about the marriage ceremony, it is rightfully a big deal. You invite all of these people, you stand before God and the pastor, and you, you know you have um, all of these people sort of giving their approval on this covenant, and you promise, you know, for better or for worse, and sickness and in health, you know, all these other things that, that are going to go wrong, and then people encounter those very things they they promised, and they, they leave. And, and in God's economy, it is a really, really big deal. The second thing, though, <coughs> in this thing there's a lot more information on, though, is that it destroys personalities. It destroys personalities. Um, here's some statistics kind of on this issue. This, these statistics deal with children, but I'm not, obviously that's the next port, the next point, divorce devours children. But these statistics, they're, they're about children, but they're not so much to make the point that it harms children, but that as it destroys the children, it destroys society. And this is, these statistics make a, re, I feel like they make a really good connection for a person listening that, dude, divorce is like, the bane of our society. It is absolutely, the breakdown of the family unit is absolutely destroying our society. It's the reason that our society has become the way that it is and is, is sliding off the cliff very quickly now. Emotional damage statistics. This is from children-and-divorce.com. Um, and um, studies in 1980 to 1981 uncovered that children in repeat divorces got lower results at school. Um, as opposed to the other children their age, oh, and the other children their, of their age rated them as less pleasant to be around. Teenage children of divorce are three times more likely, 35% instead of 13%, to need psychological help within a given year. Three times more likely. Children from divorced homes have more physiological problems than children from which one of the parents has died. Physical damage statistics. Children of divorced parents are 50% more likely to develop health problems than children in two-parent fam two families. Parent families. Children <clears throat> that are living with both biological parents are 20 to 35% physically healthier than children from broken homes. And they cite, you know, that's from Dawson, Family Structure and Children's Health and Well-Being Journal of Marriage and the Family. Most molested children come from single-parent households or are the children of drug users. Los Angeles Times, 16th of September, 1985. A child in a female-headed home is 10 times more likely to be physically hurt or murdered. Long-term effects on children in divorce statistics. In 1991, a study was done of children from which the parents were divorced six years earlier. The study found that even after all that time, these children tended to be lonely, unhappy, anxious, and insecure. 70% of long-term prison inmates grew up in broken homes. 70%. It's actually higher now. That's an older statistic. The, the statistic is actually higher now. But um, children divorce statistics indicate that children of divorced parents are four times more likely to report relational problems with peers and friends than children whose parents have kept their marriages intact. Children of divorce tend to be more aggressive towards others. This is especially the case for boys. Suicide, suicide statistics, adult children of divorce are almost twice as likely to attempt suicide than children from normal homes. The high school dropout rate of children of divorced parents is roughly two times higher than that of children of which the parents did not Divorce, that's McClanahan, Sanford, growing up with a single parent, what hurts, what helps. Harvard University Press, 1994. So they, they give all of their, these aren't just statistics pulled out of the air. I think those statistics, though, make a really good case of how, and, and I don't know if many people, though, nowadays with the way that liberals are trying to redefine even what marriage is for all kinds of different reasons, um, we live in a day and age where we need a fresh dose of this, this reality that, that marriage, marriages are the underpinning of society. They are the very foundation of society. They're what makes children good. Now, obviously, godly marriages in particular are of utmost importance, but by and large, marriages are what produce good citizens, people who are kind to their neighbors, who are altruistic, and people who, who are 
do good and, and relate to people and don't commit crimes. Statistically speaking, statistics are overwhelmingly in favor of the reality that marriage, marriages, the, a, a strong family unit with a mother and a, a father um, who stay in the house <coughs> are the foundation for a civil nation. Secondly, second point is that divorce destroy, devours children. Now, this is obvious, I think, to all of us. Um, interestingly enough, though, just like I had noted before, um, <coughs> this is there's been a lie about this for decades, and it still persists, particularly in secular and um, liberal um, uh, storefronts, sort of. You know, the storefront of the media. At the, at the surface of it all, the media, particularly the liberal media, wants you to believe that divorce is really not a big deal. Kids get over it. They actually quickly get over it. And, and when you look up, when you start looking these things up, you find a lot of kind of personal testimonials where people throw them out there where like the kid says, oh, I'm so much better off that my parents got divorced as though the, the child can look at themselves and actually judge that. You know, that's really actually not possible to judge that about yourself. You need an outside opinion. Quite frankly, I really mean that. You, you like, you know how, you can't know that you're crazy, right? Because actually truly crazy people, they don't know that they're crazy because they're so out of touch with reality. They, the reality they perceive is different than the reality that you perceive. And so you actually need, you need an outside um, source. It's just like a triangulation, you know, for like a cell phone or something like that. It's a triangulation. You need at least three sources, you know, in this reality. And so, and I really mean that. If you look on the internet, there are a lot of places where people just throw something a child says or percent. Oh, I'm so much better off. My parents got divorced. Well, yeah, you're okay because your parents were millionaires, and so you're you're highly buffered from a lot of the pains that divorce typically causes, or or whatever it is, or you perceive yourself as okay, even though your classmates might look at you just like one of those statistics and say, "Dude, Josh isn't really a whole lot of fun to be around. He's kind of a jerk." You know, and the reality is those these people tend to rate themselves a lot of the, there's a lot of it out there. Oh, my parents, you know, and, and there's a lot of this in favor of divorce and there are a lot of lies about this. So this is from Time magazine, November 6, 2000. Very interesting. The reason I looked this up is because I had found I'd, I'd known it. I'd had another um, reference about this and this this woman, um, Judith Wallerstein, she, she wrote this book called The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. And in the book, to, to kind of sum it all up for you, she essentially said that it's better for the children, for parents who want to get divorced, to stay married, even if there's constant bickering and arguing. Is to overview this book, she just flat out said, after all of her study and her research, she said, it's actually better, my research has found that it's better for the children if the parents stay together, if there's anything less than abuse, it's better than for them to stay together. Really surprising findings. Let me read this to you. I'm actually going to skip some of this. Well, maybe I won't. So this is from Time Magazine, <clears throat> November 6, 2000. One afternoon when Joanne was nine years old, she came home from school and noticed something missing. Her father's jewelry box had disappeared from its usual spot on her parents' bureau. Worse, her mother was still in bed. Daddy's moved out, her mother told her. Joanne panicked. She began to sob. And even though Joanne is 40 now, a married Los Angeles homemaker with children of her own, she clearly remembers what she did the next day. Her vision blurred by tears, she searched through the house that was suddenly not a home for the jewelry box that wasn't there. Time heals all wounds, they say. For children of divorce, like Joanne, though, time has a way of bearing old wounds, too. For Joanne, the fears that her parents split unleashed of abandonment, of loss, of coming home one day and noticing something missing from the bedroom deepened as the years went by. Bursts of bitterness, jealousy, and doubt sent her into psychotherapy. Before I met my husband, she remembers, I sabotaged all my other relationships with men because I assumed they would fail. There was always something in the back of my head. The only way I can describe it is describe it is as a void, unfinished business that I couldn't get to. Whenever concerned adults talk seriously about what's best for the children of divorce, they seem to hold the discussion in a setting, a courtroom or legislature or university where youngsters aren't allowed. 
That's changing. The children of the divorce boom are grown now, and a number are speaking up, telling stories of pain that didn't go away the moment they turned 18 or even 40. A cluster of new books is fueling a backlash, not against divorce itself, but against the notion that kids somehow coast through it. Stephanie Stahl's The Love They Lost, written by a child of divorce, is part memoir and part general, generational survey, a melancholy volume about the search for love by kids who remember the loss of love too vividly. The Case for Marriage by Linda Waite and Maggie Gallagher emphasizes the positive arguing that even rocky marriages nourish children emotionally and practically. The most controversial book comes from Judith Wallerstein, 78, a therapist and retired lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley. I want to reiterate that this woman was a professor at the most liberal school on the planet. Okay? This is not... You know, this isn't Georgia Tech or, or some southern school. This woman was a therapist and retired lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley. In the unexpected legacy of divorce, Hyperion, she argues that the harm caused by divorce is graver and longer lasting than we suspected. Her work raises a question that some people felt was settled back in the early 1970s. Should parents stay together for the kids? <clears throat> What drew someone from such a stable background to study to the study of marital distress? At the end of the 1960s, Wallerstein, whose PhD is in clinical psychology, moved from Topeka, Kansas to swinging California. Divorce was almost unheard of in the Midwest, she recalls. Not so on the West Coast. The state had just passed its pioneering no-fault divorce law. Wallerstein took a job consulting at a large community health men- mental health center in Marion, Marin County, just as the social dam began to crack. We started to get complaints, she says, from nursery school teachers and parents. Our children are having a very hard time. What should we do? The prevailing view at the time, she says, was that the divorce was no big deal for kids, so much for the power of positive thinking. We began to get all these questions, Wallerstein remembers. The children were sleepless. The children in the nursery school were aggressive. They were out of control. When Wallerstein hit the library for answers, she discovered there were none. The research hardly existed, so she decided to do her own. She had a hunch about what she would learn. I saw a lot of children very upset, she says, but I fully expected that it would be fleeting. Her hunch was wrong. Paradise for kids from ruptured families wasn't easily regained. Once once cast out of the domestic garden, kids dreamed of getting back in. The result, more often than not, was frustration and anxiety. Children of divorce suffer, suffer depression, learning difficulties, and other psychological problems more frequently than those of intact families. Some of Wallerstein's colleagues, not to mention countless divorced pa- parents, felt they were being guilt-tripped by a traditionalist. They didn't want to hear this somber news. Now, decades later, some still don't want to hear her. For parents, her book's chief finding, to be sure, is hardly upbeat or very reassuring. Children take a long time to get over divorce. Indeed, its most harmful and profound effects tend to show up as the children reach maturity and struggle to form their own adult relationships. They're gun-shy. The slightest conflict sends them running, expecting disaster. They create disaster. They look for love in strange places, Wallerstein says. They make terrible errors of judgment in whom they choose. I'm not going to read these personal things that they said there. And therein lies another problem. According to Wallerstein, the belief, quite common in children of divorce, that marriage is either a fairy tale or nothing. These jittery, idealistic children tend to hold out for the perfect mate only to find they have a very long wait. Worse, once they're convinced they found him, they're often let down. High romantic expectations tend to give way, Wallerstein reports, to bitter disillusionments. Children from broken families tend to marry later, yet divorce more often than those from intact Homes. Oh, it mirrors my life, it mirrors my experience as a child. I was thinking as I was preparing this, you guys all know probably that, you know, I'm product of, of divorce. My dad left my mom. Before I actually remember, I, I don't have a single memory of my dad living in the house with us, though we didn't live in a house. We lived in a trailer um, in the ghetto. We lived in a very, very poor part of town because my dad left my mom with two little boys. Um, making like probably 150 or 200 dollars a week to her name that she was bringing home, and so we were extremely poor, so poor that there were times. One incident that my mom shared um, once that you know 
the food that she was cooking for the dinner that night, some of it fell on the floor, and she she had to wash it off and feed it to us anyways because she didn't even have enough food to feed herself that night. That's the kind of situation that I grew up in. Though that's really not the damaging part of it. The damaging part of it is all of this internal stuff. I grew up extremely... <clears throat> I can empathize with everything they say. I extreme feelings of loneliness that always seem to rise up, emptiness, insecurity, really insecurity. Now, I never would have called it insecurity at the time, but it was this, this feeling of it was, it was never feeling secure, never feeling like I was under an umbrella of protection. Particularly at school, I was, I was easy prey for bullies and, and things like that. Um, also, though, one of the, the, fe- the feelings that would rise up is a feeling of hopelessness, a feeling that what does it matter? You know, every fairy tale is going to end in disaster and, and, and things are never going to get better because they've been bad for so long. And I can empathize with um, when Alicia and I first started dating, I like pretty much was sabotaging the relationship because I was hopeless even though we were in a dating relationship and the girl of my dreams had agreed to enter a dating relationship with me. I was just waiting for the hammer to fall. <laughs> I was just waiting for the hammer to fall and for her to, 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 to see me for what I was or to, to just find something she didn't like and to leave. And so I began, through my unbelief, to sabotage the relationship. Um, a lot of times people from this situation are unable to commit. Notice that it said godly offspring, that God desires godly offspring. That's actually kind of essentially the main reason he hates divorce is he desires godly offspring and, and divorce really devours children but not only does it devour children but it really it keeps them in a lot of ways from becoming godly and, and one of the most telling statistics is the statistic about um, incarcerated people, people that are in prison, an overwhelming majority of them. Some studies, you know, study the statistics vary but some studies they actually say like it's it's closer to ninety percent, and maybe it's talking about males, but um, it's closer to ninety percent of people in prison, of people who are incarcerated, are come from broken homes. Pretty crazy, but divorce devours children. Why am I reiterating this point? It's because it's one of the the, the boldest lies of our generation. It doesn't affect the children. They're fine. You can find tons. You start Googling it, and you can find tons of kids saying, I'm so happy my parents got a divorce. It's so much better now that there's no arguing in the house. They don't even understand the way that it's damaged them. It's altered their reality. You, they're untrustworthy, and I want to reiterate that. When you start looking at studies where qualified people who actually kind of... And I'm not a huge fan of psychology, but I will say this. Using just statistics and some of the more scientific methods that they've developed over the years, there's some really interesting stuff. And there, a lot of even secular psychologists are starting to line up with the Bible. You'll even find secular psychologists, hyper liberal people, talking about how women need to, um, <clears throat> they need to, um, what's the word? They don't, they don't say respect. They say that women need to, um, uh, no, they don't say submit. Sure. They, uh, they need to encourage their husbands and build their husbands up and make their husbands feel important. So essentially what the Bible says, though they would never say respect because that carries the idea of submission. But there's a lot of interesting stuff out there on this, um, on these things. But um, divorce absolutely destroys children. And society as a whole essentially is saying, no, it doesn't. It's all right. It's not a big deal. You know, you, you, if you ask the president what the most pressing, I'm sure you all know recent comments, he thinks... The climate change is our biggest threat, not ISIS, not, not terrorism, not the breakdown of the family. He's such a moron. I'm sorry. I, 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 I pray that he gets saved, that he repents, but he's such a moron. Um, you know, a study came out this week from the Academy, some American Academy of Science or whatever, apparently about a lot of brilliant people. They said that in 100 years, Miami and 400 other U.S. cities will be underwater because of climate change, because of our carbon footprint. What a crock. What a crock. Really? Miami's going to be underwater? What Sea levels are going to rise 20 feet? Really? There's not that much ice in Antarctica. You ever notice that all those people, they don't tend to be physicists? Sorry. They tend to be, sorry, JJ, they tend to be biologists. They're not all very good at math. I know. It's, it's a whole other thing. But, you know, you start thinking about the complexities of it, you know. I know, but the complexities, the reality, though, 
Well, we can talk about it later. Okay. There's an interesting. It's it's more complex than that. Wouldn't wouldn't you agree? Because actually, interestingly enough, here's one of the complexities I was thinking about. If it got warmer, right, water levels started to rise. The the interesting thing though is that evaporation would also increase because they talk about the waters all ending up in the ocean, you know. But you would actually have what tends to happen is there are these unexpected complex um, other things that tend. To, anyways, I think it's very highly unlikely the water levels will rise that 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 much in the next hundred years. Well, it could rise, but it might not be because of humans. I yeah, that's the other people thing. People I I obviously God the way other things have been anyway, agree. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. You know, but these 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 crazy things, I'll tell you, the number one, I really think the number one, besides secular secularism, but that's even more complex than that because I don't want religious, the, the religialization of the country. I don't want it to become, um, I, I think there should be a separation of church and state. So when I talk about secularism, it's not like I think the answer is to make the government religious. I think that would be an error, maybe even a grosser error. But those types of things, as is, is, is they set in, I'll tell you, the num- I think the number one problem in our culture, without a shadow of a doubt, is the breakdown of the marriage. And I'm not even just talking about like the homosexual agenda and redefining marriage in that way. The, the number one problem in our culture, the number one enemy in our culture, it's not from without. It's actually, it's not ISIS, I don't think. It's not um, the, the remnants of the Taliban. It's not Iran. It's, it's not... Um, now, in a, in a global sort of way, in a revelation perspective, yeah, those things are all setting into course, you know, what I believe is end time stuff. But the number one enemy of our culture is from within. It's the breakdown of the marriage. Divorce is self-destructive. Divorce is self-destructive. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Notice that it said that twice. It says that in verse 15. And in verse 16, therefore, take heed to your spirit. And the idea... If you didn't pick up on it, it's take heed to your own spirit. And this is the thing. A lot of people that buy these lies that they end up, um, they end up destroying themselves. The, 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 one of the lies that I mentioned was the idea that you'll be happier if you get a divorce. And actually the statistics are overwhelmingly in the opposite direction. Um, some people, a very small percentage of the people are happier after they get a divorce. Um, that being said, though, uh, the larger percentage of people are unhappy, are unhappier. So I want to read a, a, a article called "Do You Regret?" Do you regret getting divorced or the? Yeah. So let me read this. One woman who regrets ever getting divorced from her husband is writer. This is from the Daily Mail. It's a, one of the main. Um, media out, outlets there in uh, England. One woman, woman who regrets ever getting divorced from her husband is writer Jane Gordon. The mom of three separated from her partner after 25 years together and has now been divorced for 12 years. She previously told the Daily Mail in 2009, when my husband and I parted, my view of divorce was simplistic. Please note how that's part of the lie. My view of divorce was simplistic. I believed in the notion of divorce as a clean break and imagined a fresh start would solve all my problems. As I have discovered the hard way, it is only now, after I received my decree Nisi, that I am starting to realize the gravity of what I have done. It wasn't a decision made lightly, but I had no idea of the true complexity of unraveling a life that had been led in tandem with someone else for more than 20 years. A spokesman for the survey who asked 2,000 UK men and women that have either divorced or called time, or called time on a long-term relationship of more than five years says getting divorced is a huge step for any relationship, and sometimes the words "I want a divorce" can be said in the heat of an argument. But once you calm down and really think about things, many realize that it's the last thing they want. But by then, you can feel it's too late to take it back. And even if you don't regret it immediately, dealing with the aftermath of a breakup can lead to more second thoughts. But it's great to see some have managed to talk about the regrets and give things another go. The study found one in five said the regrets started right away, with another 19% having second thoughts within a week of saying the D word. 
And then they list the top 10 reasons for regretting a divorce, missing an ex-partner, feeling like a failure, still being in love with an ex-partner, realizing they were being unreasonable, feeling lonely, discovering the grass isn't always greener, an ex-partner finding someone new, realizing they are not better off on their own, damaging the relationship with their children, children's lives being affected. But for some, it took longer, with more than one in ten admitting it took a year or more for them to wish they hadn't left their partner. Others admitting they wish they could take things back when the divorce officially came through, especially when they have worked to divide their assets or started telling people they were calling it quits. The survey, commissioned as part of the DVD release of The Love Punch, also claimed that, over, that 95% believe the time apart during their breakup helped to ultimately save their relationship. And another 33% reckon it allowed them to take a step back and look at what went wrong in their marriage, while others said they were able to set aside their differences in that time. And credibly, 56% think their separation made them realize how much they actually valued their marriage, while 46% said it made them appreciate their other half more than they did beforehand. And I just, I'll end with this, this idea that you'll be happier if you just end it and you get out of your divorce, as the society says that it would be simple I love how this woman here, not a Christian, clearly, she said that it was like an unraveling of her life. And that's why it says, take heed to your spirit. You were one. You were made one when you got married. And it says, take heed to your spirit. Does divorce help adults become happier? This is from Utah State University. This is the overview of the study findings. It, it, basically, this is just the overview. Um, you could look it up yourself and look at it more in depth. But I, the overview does a really good job. A large majority of individuals in unhappy marriages who hang in there and avoid divorce end up reporting their marriages are very happy a uh, few years later. For the most part, those who divorced and even those who divorced and remarried were not happier than those who stuck with their marriages. About half of all divorces come from marriages that are not experiencing high levels of conflict. Individuals from these marriages generally experience a decrease in happiness over time. When individuals end high-conflict marriages, however, they increase their happiness on average. About 2 in 10 individuals appears to enhance their lives through their divorce. 20%. But about 3 in 10 seem to do worse. About 4 in 10 individuals build future romantic relationships, but they have mostly the same kinds of problems as they did in their previous marriage. Divorce can eliminate some of the problems <clears throat> with your spouse, but it can also cause others. For many couples, conflict actually increases after a divorce. Many people report having mixed feelings and even regrets about their divorce. Studies suggest that some divorced individuals wished they and or their ex-spouse had tried harder to work through their, differ their differences. About three of four divorced people will eventually remarry, however. However, second marriages have even higher rates of divorce, although if couples can hang on through the challenging first five years... I'm not sure what happened there. I copy and pasted two different things there. <laughs> okay. So I copy and pasted two different things there. So we'll, we'll end on that part there. Um, so basically, divorce destroys society. It devours the children, and it's self-destructive. That's why God hates it. It's a big deal. I really challenge you guys to consider these things. And I, I really like that in this setting, I can really just say it like it is. Most of you guys don't come from divorced homes, and... You're not even anywhere near dealing with these types of issues. And so I can say it like the Bible says because it's harder to do in a really common, in a common gathering with a bunch of adults because there are such deeply felt hurts um, along this subject. Uh, important truths. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you would bless it to our hearts and the things that were said tonight that were of you. I pray that they would sink deep down into our spirit, Lord, into each of our spirits, and that it would make us stronger, that they would strengthen us in the faith and, and that they would make us, they would change us, Lord. I pray that your word would take root in us and change us, affect those changes that we can't even change in ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.